Welcome back to Unarmored Talk Podcast. Good to see you. Good to hear you. Good to whatever's going on out there in the world. And uh, another special. This is an, a special exclusive episode with not just a Marine Corps veteran who did 75 years as an infantryman. <laughs> <laughs> but he's my brother. We served in 4th Marine Regiment, Camp Schwab together. So I don't even feel like this is a guest. I feel like I am having a virtual family reunion with another brother from my Marine Corps family. Adam Walker, what's going on, man? Hey, Mario. It's good to see you, man. And I appreciate the opportunity to be on uh, uh, you know, Unarmored Podcast with the Five Foot Three Assassin. <laughs> you know, I had to change that name when I shrunk. I went to the VA and they measured yeah. me and they said, how, how tall do you think you are? And I said, five foot three. They said, no, you're five foot two and a half. So I, mm. had, to, I had to change my whole YouTube channel name, man. Hey, that's all them sappy plates. You know what I'm saying? They, <laughs> they compress your spine. Right, right. Where, where everyone, be, be, before we jump into um, this amazing interview tonight, if you will, and before... Um, I professionally introduce uh, the guest today who's willing to remove his armor to help people develop a accurate way of thinking when life hits you with some emotional stuff. Thank you. You know, I'm going to say it. Thank you so much, everybody who's been watching, listening, sharing and supporting uh, the YouTube channel, the videos on Unarmored Talk playlist or the other videos on the YouTube channel and the audio. Um, continue to share, continue to follow, leave some rating and reviews on the podcast as we continue to do what to me is most important is making an impact on tomorrow's generation right the next generation of professionals by making a positive impact on today's youth up in pitt county north carolina all righty done with the news flash and the admin everyone adam walker is a retired master gunnery sergeant, United States Marine Corps. He is a prolific writer, uh, so he's he's very humble person. So Adam, make sure you let them know how can they find uh, you, follow you, and be able to consume some of the amazing things that you're writing. And he does a lot more in the community. Adam, please tell the listeners and viewers a little bit about yourself, my friend. Will do, Mario. Hey, first off, I just want to say I do appreciate the chance to come on. Uh, there's a lot of veteran-led pod tech podcasts out there, but what's different about yours, in my opinion, is that uh, because of the the scope uh, of how you do unarmored and, and people kind of open themselves up, and because of the, the wide array of guests you have, I think you're a key component in helping bridge this military-civilian divide. And so it's not just veterans over here in the corner just talk, telling war stories with one another, but you're you know allowing people to share lessons that are, that are really cross-cultural. So anyway, I appreciate the chance to come on there. Uh, but a little about me, I grew up in uh, Western North Carolina, graduated high school on a Friday, and Monday I was in boot camp. And then I spent the next 25 years in the Marine Corps, uh, I did three three tours in Iraq, and um, then by, I did my last five years in Okinawa, where you and I served together, and uh, just had a wonderful, wonderful time, man. And uh, you know, had a lot of adventures. Uh, you know, uh, as J.R.R. Tolkien said, sometimes adventures aren't very fun while you're having them. Uh, you know, so uh, there were certainly some hard times, but uh, I'm very grateful to be living in this season in life. I live down just outside of Camp Lejeune, and uh, I still work with the Marines as a contractor. And then, as you mentioned, I do I do a bit of writing. And so um, if anyone wants to check anything out, they can uh, check out my blog. It's called takeitontheleftfoot.com. And so linked on there are the various uh, articles that I've published, um, uh, mainly in the veteran community, but I've had things in the Marine Corps Gazette, Leatherneck Magazine, The War Horse, We Are the Mighty, and uh, Eddie's Veterans Magazine. And so there's links on my blog to, to all of that work. Some of it's uh, uh, perspectives on war and essay, some of it's leadership stuff, and a lot of it's just funny. Uh, you know, just got some short military humor stuff out there. <laughs> I like that too. Take it on the left foot.com. Anyone can learn from Adam Walker. I'm telling you guys. And, and thank you for the positive feedback, you know, on the uh, Unarmored Talk podcast. Um, so I appreciate you and all the previous guests, uh, if they served or not, you know, had the courage to remove their armor uh, to help other people, um, you know, discuss a life challenge or a challenge, which let's get right into the topic. You know, you mentioned 25 years. You know, I love how you kind of, you know, shape that. Sometimes the journey may not be fun. 
um, yeah. and, 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 you know, three combat tours and multiple deployments. And so let's kind of jump right into the topic. From my basic understanding, Adam, is one of your deployments, there was a situation where you lost the ability to lead, right? The, the ability uh, to do what you wanted to do because of uh, an injury of some sort. Talk to me, what happened? Yeah, so on my second of uh, three deployments to Iraq, uh, I was a platoon sergeant in an infantry battalion. And um, but the short of it is we were in the Battle of Husayra on uh, April 17th, 2004. And uh, it, was a, it was a pretty big gunfight. And I wound up taking a piece of shrapnel uh, in my arm from a, from a grenade. It was dropped from the roof above me. And then uh, when it exploded, a piece of it went in my arm, a piece of it went in the magazine pouch on my hip and then burst into flames. And then when I turned around to, to take cover, uh, someone opened up with an AK-47 from the roof and it tore through my hamstring. So uh, it went just in and out of my leg. So I had a gunshot wound to the leg. I had shrapnel to the arm. And um, they were I was traveling with a, a squad that had a Lance Corporal squad leader. And... Uh, there were two other injuries in the squad, uh, one of them being the squad leader and one being a, a PFC who was getting ready to turn 19 the next day. And so uh, we were uh, we had, didn't have communication with the rest of the unit. And we set up a uh, we basically occupied a house and set up a casualty collection point until we could figure things out. And so uh, there were some bad guys in the house and, you know, we got them uh, under security, took care of them. We, we put the family in the back so they would stay safe. And uh, half of the squad went on the roof uh, to continue to fight and provide security while we figured out what we we're going to do. And uh, there was a there were a couple of Marines that were with the combined anti armor team, right? The cat team, uh, two Marines and a corpsman. They brought the corpsman up to us because they heard casualties, so they brought the corpsman to us. And um, when I, I when I got in the house and looked around, I was trying to figure out what we we're going to do. But this this Marine sergeant, right? So he was he was uh, one rank below me. He had, he had come up with a captain. He approaches me. He holds a GPS uh, and he says, I know where we are. I'm going for help. And I thought, that's a great idea. I said, that's a really good plan. Um, yeah. And then I said, I said, let's make sure that we have security on the roof before you go. Um, when security was set, he bounded back. And so we were in this house about two and a half, uh, maybe three hours uh, when my company gunny came up with some Marines and, a, and some stretchers. Um, but uh, what I had kind of alluded to before, the, the, the limitations I had is, you know, as, as a platoon sergeant, I was the senior guy there, and uh, I felt an obligation uh, as, as a leader to go check on the guys. But I had this, I had these wounds, so I had, a, you know, the, the hole in my leg, the shrapnel in my arm. Uh, but in addition to the pain, I, I was feeling like really lightheaded. So when I tried to go up on the stairs and check on the guys, I, I got real lightheaded and I had to place my hand against the wall and, uh, and, and almost fell down. And I remember the corpsman and the other Marines were like, hey, staff sergeant, you need to sit down. You need to sit down. Uh, but as a leader, I felt compelled, like I need to go up there. But I, I reached this physical limitation where I said, well, if I pass out, I'm going to be more of a liability than I am, you know, trying to meet my obligations as a leader. And so uh, although I would tell you that I trust my guys because of my, my limitations with the wounds, I had to really trust them. Right. So so they were on the roof. I couldn't go up there and inspect them, you know, give them any guidance or anything. I just had to trust that the squad leader, the Lance Whipple up there, that he right. was going to do, do the right thing. And you and, know, um, you know, Adam, if I may, and I just want the listeners and viewers to, to grasp this. I'm listening to you. You know, you don't just have injuries. You, you have f fragmentation. You know, you have shrapnel from a grenade. Yeah. And then you have, uh, and what's the round size of an AK-47? Uh, 7.62 millimeters. 7.62. If you're watching the video, it's it's probably about that big. And if you're listening, I, I challenge you. I, I don't challenge you. I, I ask that you get on the YouTube channel and and and, and watch this video. So, so you have a, a 7.62 round that went through your leg. You have the shrapnel from gray. Two and a half to three hours <laughs> since your injuries. Yeah. And you're still trying to lead. Yeah, we know the Marine Corps, uh, they do a couple of things. One, they create an individual's, uh, a phrase we use is a bias for action, right? That means you're going to do something. You don't just sit around and, you know, you don't wait. You, you have a bias, right? A predisposition to take action. The other thing the Marines teach at leaders of all level is to delegate authority. Yeah. And so one of the reasons why I could trust my people, number one, it was a well-trained unit. Um Sometimes you hear the phrase that people rise to the occasion, but the combat veterans will tell you that that's not exactly true. Marines default to their level of training. 
So if your organization is well-trained, then trust is going to be a whole lot better there. And if you have an organization where there's a, uh, you delegate authority down to the lowest level, it's a well-trained unit and there's a bias fraction then you can trust your people. And so uh, I was put in a place where that wasn't a conscious choice. It was, uh, it, you know, it was placed upon me because I didn't have another choice. I had to trust the guys. Uh, but fortunately, the circumstances were such that I could trust them. And, uh, you know, not to give away the entire story, but that Lance Corporal squad leader uh, was awarded the Silver Star for his actions that day as a Lance right. Corporal. And so. Yeah. Um, and Adam, I love how here it is. You're 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 in charge, per se. You know, you're you, se. You have the senior ring, your staff sergeant, yeah. you know, compared to the, it, it, it. Now you had to, it was a choice, you know, for you to listen to the feedback, the advice they're giving you, staff yeah. sergeant. You need to yeah. relax, <laughs> you yeah. know, and, and for you to, to get to that point where you can now be led by those you were leading, I believe is very co commendable. And it's, it's and extremely, so yeah, it's extremely humbling because the decision to take this house and set up the casualty collection point wasn't my decision. Uh, the, I, the plan to bound back and do a physical link up to, for the aid and letter team to basically get help. That wasn't my plan either. Right. Um, and then, you know, obviously I wasn't on the roof and the Marines uh, performed honorably up there to engage in the enemy and not engaging, you know, others who were there. So, uh, yeah, I was just surrounded by quality people. And so uh, that's why I say I was in charge per se. But really, uh, uh, the decision make was uh, decentralized all the way down. And mm -hmm. none of the Marines looked to me to say, what are we going to do next? That didn't happen. And so um, I, I'm just very humbled by that. Wow. And and, and I love, too, how you, you talked about. You, you know, people don't rise to the occasion that, you know, that's an inaccurate <laughs> belief. That's right. You, you know, I used to, you know, that metaphor, yeah. belief, cliche, whatever you want to use, you, yeah. you know, how we, we trained, well-trained, well-developed, not just a military unit, any company, any yeah, organization, organization. well-trained, but we'll talk to this episode, well-trained Marines and sailors, where that level of trust was built well before you went into that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you have a well-trained organization and yeah. then we have a decentralized uh, authority, you build an atmosphere where, where trust is, uh, is standard fare, uh, but you build a relationship where it's like a family. And not only is that good for the overall organization, but when an individual, right, perhaps a leader has a moment of self-doubt or a moment of self uh, uh, indecisiveness, it doesn't become a crisis because you're part of an organization and the organization will, will carry you through that moment of indecision or that moment of doubt. The organization carries you through and it's something that you're a part of. Now, now here you are, you take a knee, you, you know, you're waiting to be mad at that because you don't know the extent of your injuries at, mm. at any point. Did you feel an emotion of despair an emotion of regret did you experience any emotions at this point? And uh, what were no, they? So I didn't have any emotions of despair or panic. Um, as a leader, actually, I think it's a little bit easier not to think about yourself because you have other people that you're responsible for. So I was concerned with the guys that were around me because uh, they were there was probably not one of them older than 22. So they're all wow. between the ages of 18, 22. So they're pretty young guys. I was, uh, I was about to turn 27, so I was kind of salty, <laughs> you know, as a 27-year-old. Uh, now in middle age, I think 27 is youthful, but... We need some yeah. been gay at that point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I will tell you, uh, the, the, the one bit of fear I did have was this, is that uh, I was afraid we were still going to be in that house after dark. Mm -hmm. Because mm. uh, the enemy, they knew the city better better than we did. And so uh, the cover of darkness would give them an increased uh, ability to, to move around and us not be able to track them. And uh, knowing that we didn't have communication, we already had injuries and we're a couple of hours uh, into the injuries. So I did have this uh, th this slight feeling of dread that we would still be there after dark, but but we weren't. Before dark, uh, again, my company Gunny and some uh, Marines with stretchers came, you know, beating up on feet and uh, you know, to bail us out of there. Isn't that amazing? The fear that you, the emotional fear you experienced was the fear to be in a situation that you cannot provide adequately for those you're leading. That's yeah. powerful. 
ladies and gentlemen, everyone, you know, again, having not the fear of your own life. I mean, again, and I'm, I'm sure you still bleed and try to figure these things out. But Adam Walker hit the, the emotion of fear he experienced was we, we got to be able to do something before that sun drops because the probability of my folks, right, the folks I'm leading and managing, uh, they may be, be in greater danger. Um, you know, then what and they I, are. I, and I'll tell you now. two very powerful things that happened once they showed up with the stretchers. Number one, the Marine that was wounded the worst, um, we put him on a stretcher. Uh, and then they looked at me and they said, hey, Seth's aren't getting a stretcher. And I, and I said, no, I, I can I can make it back. Right. And I said that because I knew that if I got on a stretcher, it would take two to four Marines to carry me. And that's two to four Marines. That's not being able to you know, use their rifles and get security. I said, well, I, I can make it. But I looked at the squad leader who was wounded and I told him, get, get in the stretcher. And he said, I'm good. And then, you know, I'm, I'm in charge, right? I said, get in the stretcher. And he looked at me very fiercely and he said, I'm good. And uh, I, I really had like tears of pride in my, in my eyes because uh, without communicating any further, I realized he's a leader just like me. He knows the cost of him getting in a stretcher just like I do. And he's saying, I can make it a little bit longer. And so then that that allowed more Marines to maintain security when we bound back. And that one Marine that was in the stretcher, he didn't lay there like a victim. No, he was laying in the stretcher with his rifle, providing security for the guys carrying his stretcher. Wow. And and, and I would tell you that. And and these are these are very young men. And uh, I just uh, seeing them be uh, so concerned with the rest of the team, not with themselves. It was a very humbling thing. And and really even to even to, to, to reflect on it, I get tears in my eyes of, of tear, tears of pride uh, with working with these guys. And it was a tough fight when we got back to the company lines. There were, there were five Marines who were who, who, who had gotten killed in the fight. So they're laid out under ponchos beside me while I'm getting ready to get medevac. And it's just a, you know, having to, to get medevac and leave while the rest of the unit goes back into the fight is, is one of the most difficult things I've ever had to face. Um, but fortunately, I feel very fortunate that after being medevac all the way back to uh, 29 Palms, California, uh, less than 90 days later, I came back to Iraq to finish the deployment with the unit. And I'm so incredibly grateful to have uh, the opportunity to come back and finish with the boys because the men, uh, because uh, the day we, we came back, uh, the unit had gotten hit and uh, three guys from the platoon got killed um, as I was making my way back. And so I got back just in time for the memorial service. And then to, and they, they uh, provided me the opportunity to come right back and take over my platoon again and say, all right, fellows, we got, you know, we still got a couple of months to go. Let's, let's get our head in the game and let's try to finish this. And, um, you know, another, another kind of sad part of that is uh, my company Gunny, a few weeks, the one who came to bail us out with uh, the stretchers, uh, he got right. killed a few weeks later. And so he, yeah. he didn't come home from that deployment. Well, well, Adam, you know, I know you're having lots of fun. I don't say busy anymore because I know you, man. And, and you are doing some wonderful things. And so be, before I let you go to continue to inspire the world, one, um, my hearts and prayers continue to go out with those families and those Marines that were lost um, when you were there. And, and, and also those who, who are still struggling and dealing with those memories because you, you know, my belief is we grieve for, for quite some time. And so my hat's off to you for, for removing your courage and again, special, you know, my prayers and thoughts for the for the Marines we lost. Um, looking back on everything, I mean, the, you know, the ability to trust people around you, the ability to train and develop before you even go into the occasion, um, and then your ability to continue to lead and manage, man, you know, with these significant injuries. If you had to give a person one piece of advice um, that you've learned from that very, very challenging experience, man, what would you give them? Uh, if it boiled down to one thing, I would say invest in people. Uh, relationships matter. And I've often told Marines that the Marine Corps, above all, is a core of Marines. And so it's, it's all about people. So yeah, invest in relationship, invest in your people, um, because they, they, they are your family. Well, you've invested in me. You made my life easy at Camp Schwab and Fourth Marine. So I can tell, I can say that personally, that, man, I love working with you. I would have worked with you forever. And you oh, definitely yes, invested in this now five foot two and a half guy. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we realized how small the Marine Corps was because your roommate at DI school is a good buddy of mine from the grunts. Right. And so uh, realized just how small the Marine Corps was. 
<laughs> well, everybody, you guys heard it. Lots of amazing tips that you can apply to your life during any challenge um, that can be a crisis to you. And just like Adam said, you know, be intentional. Invest in people. Invest in people. Adam, thank you. Tell your family I said hello. And I hope to see you at the next Gray Beard Luncheon Man on Base. <laughs> yes, sir. We'll see you there, brother. I'll make sure I put a picture in the overlay. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone, until next time, thank you again for supporting the show. And you guys know the deal. God bless you. God bless your families. And God bless your friends. And be safe until next time.